Hello, I'm Sachi Yonari Rizzo, curator of Princeton Drawings. Every other month I present a talk in the Print and Drawing Studies Center and offer it virtually. You may have noticed that contemporary prints can be large in scale, complex in color and composition, and at times even three-dimensional. It begs the question, are the artists making these prints on their own? We envision artists working alone in their studios, the creative genius. However, mediums like glass, sculpture, and printmaking can be more collaborative. For this season, we will look at the development of the post-World War II print renaissance in the U.S., seen in the proliferation of printmaking workshops, their interconnections, and the artists with whom they were making some of the most exciting prints that we see today. In September, we looked at Pratt Graphic Center, Universal Limited Art Editions, and Tamarin Lithography Workshop, the pioneers of the print revival for the reinvigoration of lithography. Today, we will look at the growth of print workshops through Tamarin's influential master print program and Crown Point Press. In 1960, June Wayne founded Tamarin Lithography Workshop in Los Angeles, along with Clinton Adams and Gero Entrigian. As its name suggests, the organization is dedicated to elevating the status and increasing the accessibility of lithography. Renamed Tamarin Institute it is now located in Albuquerque, a division of University of New Mexico. Tamarin continues to publish prints and offer residencies for artists working in diverse styles. Artists work closely and collaborate with a master printer. They are encouraged to experiment and extend the expressive potential of the medium. In addition to its role as a print publisher, Tamarin continues to be an important resource in the development of new lithographic techniques and materials. That one might be more noticeable. Mm -hmm. I just looked up. I'm not sure when it started doing that. That's okay. I'll, I'll hopefully be able to do it. If not, we can re record that session. Okay. I've included Tamara's identifying symbol for the print studio known as a chop mark, which is a stamp usually embossed in the paper. We see it over on the right, over here. And then you hopefully can see the outline of the mark just to the left and below the drawn area. So let's see down in this area. It is sometimes called a blind stamp. Tamara's chop mark uses an alchemist symbol for stone. And this is probably a reference to the stones used as the matrix in lithography. One of Tamarin Institute's biggest legacies is its training program. This was conceived by June Wayne back in the beginning with the intent to create a pool of master printers. They went on to teach or have opened their own print shops. Over the years, Tamarin's training program has developed and changed from learning solely from observation and hands-on experience to a more formally structured educational program. Over the course of two years, printer fellow apprentices learned the technical side of lithography, work with University of New Mexico graduate students, and culminate with a collaboration with professional artists who are in residence at Tamarin. When printer fellows attain a professional level proficiency, they can design their chop own chop mark. Similar to how the artists sign the print, Tamarin printers add their unique chop mark to signify their involvement in the process. Here we can faintly see the lizard shape used by printer Ben and at Ben Andams. The embossed mark is just to the right of the drawn area. So we have this lizard um, chop mark here printed, and then you can kind of see it over here as well. Erwin Hollinger was a master printer trained at Tamarin. In 1963, he was appointed technical director. In an oral history, he recalled, I absolutely fell in love with the idea of working closely with the artists all day. Hollander was the first to leave Tamarin and he founded his own print shop in 1964 named Hollander's Workshop, located in East Village in New York City. In 1972, he closed his shop and turned to teaching at Cranbrook Academy of Art, where he was head of printmaking from 1973 to 75. Subsequently, Hollander focused on the making of his own work. Hollander published Portfolio 9, which consisted of lithographs by nine artists, including Willem de Kooning, Roy Lichtenstein, Sam Francis, Ellsworth Kelly, Richard Lindler, Louise Nevelson, and Robert Motherwell, whose work we see here. 
Hollander went on to work with several artists of the several of the artists individually. Hollander was known for his success in convincing some of the leading abstract expressionist painters to try their hand at printmaking. In this lithograph from Portfolio 9, Robert Motherwell was able to translate the strong gestural quality of his paintings into a print form and use it in a more intimate scale. Hollander excelled in the use of the liquidy flowing medium called touche that we see here. A memorable print in Hollander's career was this lithograph created by John Cage. Known mostly for his experimental musical compositions, John Cage was commissioned by art patron Alice Weston to make a work in response to the recent death of his friend and revolutionary artist Marcel Duchamp. Duchamp pioneered the ready-made using manufactured objects. This was a precursor to conceptual art. The most notorious of his ready-mades was Fountain, a men's urinal that he signed with an alternative name. The title of this lithograph is Not Wanting to Say Anything About Marcel. It is a reference to artist Jasper Johns and his response to receiving a request to make a tribute to the dead artist. In essence, Cage uses John's words about not wanting to create a tribute for Cage's own tribute. This was Cage's first print series. The series included eight edition screen printed plexigrams and two lithographs, A and B. We have lithograph B and is an eight color lithograph made from eight, um, eight plates. For this collage effect, Cage intentionally relied on chance rather than making conscious choices. He did this by applying the I Ching, a Chinese text dating back to about 1000 BC to his art. A flip of a coin helped determine the placement of words, letters, and images. He collaborated with Calvin Sumasyun, who was an artist and designer. One of Hollander's students was Kenneth Tyler, seen here at Tamarin. Tyler was an, has an Indiana connection as well. He enrolled in the printmaking program at Heron School of Art in Indianapolis in 1962 before working at Tamarin. Tyler succeeded Hollander as technical director at Tamarin um, and in 1965 left his position to found Gemini. Initially, Tyler did contract work or printing for other publishers to support the business. In 1966, he moved away from contract work changed the name to Gemini GEL, the GEL stands for Graphic Editions Limited, and partnered with Sidney Felsen and Stanley Grinstein. The thought was to partner with mature artists. A common thread that continues through their history is Tyler's ability to incorporate technological innovation, industrial processes, and large scale. This attracted younger artists. In 1965, Tyler designed the first of several hydraulic lithographic presses, and two years later, he received a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts for research and development of paper, embossing, and three-dimensional works. Gemini is credited with introducing Frank Stella to lithography. Stella is best known for his geometric abstractions in paint and in sculptural reliefs that extend off the wall. Between 1967 and 2001, Stella created more than 315 individual print editions. Union, seen here, is part of the Eccentric Polygon series. The colors appear straightforward and discreet. Stella drew expressive gestural marks with lithographic crayon on eight aluminum plates controlled with gray geometric contours printed in screen print. The layered marks from different intensities of color are through overlaid inks. To give you an idea, the reddish and orange areas are made up of red, cerise, red, violet, magenta, transparent red, and transparent magenta inks. Gemini's collaboration with Klaus Oldenburg on his profile airflow in 1968 signals the beginning of the creation of sculpture and untraditional editions as seen here with editions by Willem de Kooning and Donald Judd. Although referred to as print workshops, a print work workshop, Gemini also published edition sculpture. In 1974, Tyler separated from his partners to open up Tyler Graphics, moving across the country, first to New Bedford, and then later Mount Kisco, New York. He rel his relatively close proximity to New York City gave him access to artists. As prints became increasingly larger and more complex, he capitalized on new materials and techniques. Tyler built specialized equipment. He patented and registered Tycor, a rigid archival honeycomb paper panel in 1978, 
and a decade later, he designed and constructed a computer-controlled, power-driven combination lithography and etching press. Always the innovator, Tyler also explored with hand papermaking to accommodate the needs of the artists. He was at Arjamari Prio, a fine art paper manufacturer in France that Tyler discovered continuous rolls of mold-made paper, which could be cut to any size. The prohibitive costs of importing such products, though, made his, this a short-term solution and led to Tyler to develop connections with paper makers close to home. Eventually, Tyler set up his own facilities. Ron Davis, his Intaglio print incorporates color paper pulp that you see in the speckling of diffused color throughout, the liquefied pigmented pulp impregnating the surface. Other artists who experimented with paper pulp at, at Tyler Graphics include Kenneth Nolan, Ellsworth Kelly, and most notably David Hockney for his paper pulp series. The Red Sea by Helen Frankenthaler is another example of an image that looks seemingly simple, in this case largely monochromatic, but in fact there is complexity to it. This is the fourth lithograph that Frankenthaler made with Tyler Graphics, and she drew using touche wash and litho crayon. To achieve the veils of layered color, they used a total of eight inks and added to the color by printing on a sheet of pale pink handmade paper. Yoguchi's Okinawa pet woodpecker is from Frank Stella's Exotic Bird series and taken from a preliminary drawing in gouache. There were 27 runs from 15 plates and 11 screens. One of the runs used a different color reusing a screen. They even used silver ink and silver glitter. Yoguchi's Okinawa woodpecker is a marriage between screen print and lithography. Previously in Union, he used screen print as well, but only to print precise lines. In lithography, there is a tendency for the paper to stretch, making that exactness more problematic and challenging. Instead of polygon shapes, Stella prints gridded graph paper along the border. Winged flowing curved shapes of drafting tools like ship curve and French curve recall his early use of protractors. The Exotic Bird series extended across different mediums, eventually creating as large, created as large scale aluminum reliefs. In 1987, Tyler moved his operations to Mount Kisco in a space specifically built for their workshop. With this move, the prints became increasingly complex and larger. I'm including Juam by Frank Stella, although it's not in the collection because it is a marvel, measuring over six and a half feet, using seven different printmaking techniques, hand paper that was hand dyed. It also involved using six, 66 found and fabricated metal printing elements derived from the artist sculpture projects at the time and were cut and fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. Tyler retired in 2000 and the shop's printmaking presses were sent to the Singapore Tyler Print Initiative where they continue to be used. Former Pameron print master printer Jack Lemon opened Landfall Press in Chicago in 1970, the first professional print shop in the Midwest. Some of you have probably seen the exhibition here at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art on view right now showcasing 50 years of work at Landfall Press. There are still a few days left in the run of the exhibition. While Landfall offers work in Italian and woodcut, their main focus is working in lithography. Lemon worked with Chicago artists, conceptual artists, but had strong ties with realists like Alfred Leslie, Martha Mayer, Erla Bacher, and Philip Perlstein, both seen here. Pearlstein was a renowned figure painter in the 1960s until his death last year. He was committed to representational work despite the dominance of abstraction and pop art. He worked from live models in a dispassionate matter, manner and treated the body as yet another formal element rather than an allegorical or, or symbolic. To create an interesting composition, his subjects take on informal poses are often cropped and are bathed in art artificial light. Erla Bacher was known for her figurative works and still lifes. She looked to the Italian Renaissance and wanted to adapt their ideas into her own time period. Working from live models as well, she used the nude figure as metaphors of the human condition. The print reads very monochromatic. A warm golden light washes over the entire print, which is actually made up of the four colors. 
We see the diverse, diverse range of artistic styles that attracted Lemon in this more abstract lithograph by Pat Steer. Steer, who is a painter, made her first prints at Lad Landfall Press. The iris flowers throughout the work may refer to Pat's first name, which is Iris. Patricia is her middle name. Bay Area artist Tom Holland's lithograph Nelson comes out of a collaboration with Cirrus Editions. Jean Robert Milan was another former Tamarin apprentice, and he founded Cirrus Editions in 1970 in Los Angeles. The workshop's chalk mark is two cirrus clouds. Milant usually starts by visiting an artist's studio and becoming familiar with his or her work. Next, he invites the artist to come to cirrus and check out the facilities. Then the collaboration begins. Artists are idea-driven and printers are technique-driven, Milant says. A good print is achieved when the printer uses technical knowledge of how the pr press, plate, paper, and ink work together to bring the artist's idea to life. Milant was committed to supporting the work of local artists and was attracted to Southern California conceptual works by John Baldessari, Bruce, Bruce Nauman, and Ed Ruscha. In works with Ruscha, they explored using food and household fluids as, as the ink. Bud Sharp has a BS degree from University of Wisconsin-Madison and an MA from University of New Mexico, Albuquerque. He is another Tamarin trained master printer completing his training while he was still located in Los Angeles. Shark worked for two printmaking presses in London before opening his first workshop in Boulder, Colorado in 1976. It has been in Lyons since 1998. Like most shops, he began with commission contracted work. As he transitioned into publishing, his relationship with Colorado organizations and their artist in residence programs were key, especially Anderson Ranch Art Center in University of Colorado Boulder, where there is a archive of the press's work. We own a woodcut by John Buck, created at Sharks Inc. Buck primarily works as a, um, as a sculptor in wood and bronze. He was inspired by a visit to China, viewing large-scale rubbings taken from stone tablets and relief carvings. In 1983, he was asked to be a visiting artist at the University of Colorado Boulder. The school asked the artist to create a woodblock for them to print. However, they weren't prepared for the scale, so they called Bud Shark. Great Falls is a stunning five-color wood, woodcut made eight years after their initial meeting. To achieve this large scale, it's actually 83 and three quarter by 66 inches. Um, buck framed rows of one by four inch wooden planks. After they form a large smooth surface, he draws into them with a nail or a dull stylus or pencil. In most woodcuts, wood is cut away to create lines, which when printed will stand out against a light background. Buck reverses this creating a white line technique, cutting into the wood for lines. Buck tends to juxtapose a large, flat, bully colored form against a busy field of symbols resembling a diary or a sketchbook. Great Falls is more personal and biographical with the abundance of images recalling his sculpture. The print takes its title from Great Falls, Montana, a reference to Buck's state he calls home, as well as to the water that flows or falls down the print. Buck acknowledges the Japanese printmaking tradition with a subtle transition in color often seen in Japanese woodblock prints from the 19th century. He also makes allusions to the culture with the stylized stream reminiscent of Japanese painting sunscreens. In most of these workshops, the emphasis was on lithography, but eventually branched out to different printmaking techniques. Crown Point Press was founded in 1962 in San Francisco in the San Francisco Bay Area by Keith and Brown, 27 at the time, and then husband Gerald Parker, although his role was temporary. Brown's name is synonymous with the studio. Unlike other print workshops, Crown Point Press focused exclusively on intaglio for the first 20 years. Brown's reasons, she said, was intaglio in relief printing, use old processes that have no commercial value and need all the help they can get to stay alive. Similar to June Wayne and lithography at Tamarin, Kate and Brown wanted to bring life to uh, intaglio. Intaglio prints are often smaller than lithographs, screen prints, and relief prints that speak with bold, bright, big colors and sizes. Brown studied at Antioch College beginning as an English major. 
For her junior year, she studied at the Central School of Arts and Crafts in London, where she became fascinated with intaglio printmaking. She continued her study there for another year. In the summer of 1959, she found a dissembled, disassembled etching press, which she was able to bring back to the U.S. Brown set it up at a friend's studio where it was used by members of the California Society of Etchers. Brown was inspired to name the studio by an 1877 photograph of the Crown Point gold mine with the proud employees in front of the building and railroad trestles. Early on, she visited June Wayne at Tamron for recommendations about printing standards and how to run a successful professional print shop. Like other print shops, Crown Point Press began with contract work. Brown worked on her business rather part-time as she worked secretarial jobs and teaching printmaking at San Francisco Art Institute. Brown set up a system allowing artists access to the workshop through hourly and daily rates. Some artists self-printed and self-published. She, she also did contractual work. Later, Crown Point Press went on to do publishing as well, which meant picking up all the associated costs. Brown began working with Saul LeWitt in 1971 as a printer for a publication by Parasol Press. Brown recalled, Saul must have felt confounded when he arrived to find that he had traveled 3,000 miles to this little basement in somebody's house with kids and dogs about, and only myself and two students to help him. LeWitt stayed at her home eating meals with the family. Eventually, LeWitt created over 300 etchings at Crown Point Press. Robert Feldman at Parasol Press contracted Crown Point on a project with Wayne Tebode, and while he had reservations, he discovered the crisp lines and subtle tonal effects possible in etching and aquatint, and were a perfect marriage with the minimalist and conceptualist art he had sought to publish. So seen here is one of LeWitt's prints lit much later, characteristic with his use of spare simple lines. Brown's reputation grew, and she also did contract work for John Bergruen Gallery and Marion Goodman's Multiples. Robert Feldman advised that Brown should focus on self-publishing, which is no small financial feat. In 1977, she began considering her own independent projects um, for economic and aesthetic reasons. Brown envisioned Crown Point as a studio rather than a print shop with an artist workspace that was a part of the printmaking er press area. Gemini and Tyler Graphics have that division of areas as well. Eva, uh, this is a work by Yvonne Jaquette. Um, the work is entitled Clouds Obscuring San Diego and is an exec excellent example of the use of aquatint to get all the nice, these really beautiful gradual tonalities. They use nine copper plates and a total of 16 colors mixed from powdered pigments and etching inks. Jaquette's print shows San Diego from a bird's eye perspective, which tends to abstract the subject into flat colors and flames. It was based on a pastel drawing that Jaquette made during a flight to visit her mother. The hazy nighttime view scattered with city lights is interrupted by clouds. Signs and lights dissolve into a pattern of glowing dots and defining contours blur, evoking a feeling of ambiguity and loneliness. Al Held worked with Crown Point during this time period with some etchings entailing 30 colors and had the accolade of presenting printers with the most technical challenges. Straits of Magellan in our collection on the left is grand in scale, measuring 41 and a quarter by 51 and a quarter inches. The image is made um, first by outlining the shapes and then filling those in with an extensive network of meticulously drawn hatching and cross hatching giving variations of tone, a sense of volume, and space. By the 1980s, Brown had been working solely in intaglio and was yearning to try something new. Lithography was already promoted by so many print shops. Screen print and relief cut had potential and its use was pretty widespread. The result was a woodcut project lasting from 1982 to 1994 with ties to Kyoto, Japan, and later China. At the same time, Crown Point's interest expanded to artists working throughout the world. Italian painter Francesco Clemente traveled from Italy to California in 1981. A number of artists working in the 1970s, including Clemente, demonstrated a renewed interest in expressionism, and like European artists in the early 20th century, took the, to the immediacy of the carved woodcut. The aesthetic of Car Crown Point Press, though, has been nuanced and subtle found in Italian printing. 
So it is not surprising that Brown did not turn to the European expressionist approach to woodcut. Instead, she turned to the woodblock printing tradition of Japan. Oil-based ink is typically used in European and American printmaking. Japanese prints use water-based ink and as many as 50 blocks could be used to create gradations in tone. I've, I have an example by Urugawa Hiroshige from our permanent collection um, on the right, and you can see those gradations of tone, particularly along the edge of the blue sky and the deep blues in the water. Crown Point Press conceived the idea of inviting contemporary artists to create works using the traditional Japanese woodblock medium by working with carvers and printers in Kyoto, beginning in 1982. Clemente's print looks like a watercolor, but is made with 14 wood blocks and 45 colors. Wayne Thiebaud's woodcut Hill Street is another example of this collaboration utilizing 28 colors. First, the artist provides the design in the form of a watercolor drawing. The watercolor is traced and this is adhered to a smooth hardwood block. Then the professional wood carver cuts away the unprinted portions of the wood block. The printer then applies a thin coat of transparent water-based water ink on the block and lays down um, a sheet of paper. The printer rubs the back of the paper with a round pad called a baron to transfer the ink to the paper. The printer and artist work together to finalize the print. Brown stepped back from doing the printing herself and by 1979 had passed along those responsibilities to staff. Brown did not set up a formal training printing program like Tamarin Institute but she does have many former master printers who went on to open their own print shops. Examples include Patricia Branstead of Arrow Press and Branstead Studio, New York, and Pam Paulson of Paulson Fontaine Press in California. Thank you for tuning in today. Please join me on January 10th when we continue this series on printmaking workshops, and we will look at workshops that have affiliations with colleges and universities.